press officer for the symposium. I should say at the outset that although uh, this press conference is being held uh, on United Nations premises and we're honored with the, pres with the presence here uh, of the Habitat Secretary General, uh, this is not an official United Nations occasion. The Vancouver Symposium is a group of uh, 24 private citizens who are here in their personal capacities, and we are using uh, these premises today by courtesy of Bill Powell, uh, head of the UN Office of Public Information. Uh, before uh, I introduce uh, the chairman of, of this uh, uh, group, uh, could I just say that uh, the text of the declaration is available outside uh, in the document center, as is a press release. The press release is at the moment available in French translation, and the declaration will be available, uh, thanks to the Canadian Habitat Secretariat, in French, probably within the hour. Uh, I apologize for the fact that we don't have it translated yet. Uh, the uh, platform here will be introduced by uh, Mr. Maurice Strong, uh, who is, as you know, the chairman of Petro Canada and the former executive director of the UN Environment Programme, and uh, has acted as one of the two co-chairmen of the Vancouver Symposium. Mr. Strong. Thank you very much. Very good to see in this audience so many of the people who followed us through from Stockholm where the idea for Habitat was born. I would like to say that I'm speaking on behalf of Dr. Sojaboko, my co-chairman. I've been asked, I guess, because the conference is being held in uh, my country this time, uh, to speak on behalf of the members of the Vancouver Symposium. Uh, I would like uh, to mention very briefly uh, what the Vancouver Symposium is. It was convened under the sponsorship of the National Audubon Society, the Population Institute, and the International Institute for Environment and Development. It gathered together a group of uh, eminent people in various fields from around the world, uh, designed to examine very carefully based upon their own experience and based upon their analysis of the conference documentation, uh, the uh, issues being presented to governments. Their report, which was completed after two days of intense deliberations only around midnight last night, and the very, very dedicated staff have been working uh, all through the night uh, trying to produce the piece of paper which you now have uh, before you. And thanks only to their efforts, uh, this uh, it has been possible to get the statement ready. Uh, I uh, would simply like in introducing it first to introduce the members uh, of the uh, symposium who are here. Um, and notably on the platform, we have, uh, first of all, I will start on my left, uh, Lady Jackson, Barbara Ward, uh, who has been the rapporteur uh, and principal organizer of the symposium. I will say nothing more about her. I've described her as Lady, uh, Lady Spaceship Earth, uh, and Miss One Earth. She is also Lady Habitat. Uh, um, on my... The author, as you know, of Home of Man, the, the, the uh, intellectual, major intellectual input to the conference. On my immediate uh, right, uh, we have the honor of the presence of the official uh, organizer of the conference, the Secretary General, uh, my good friend, uh, Enrica Penalosa. <laughs> I've already referred to our, my distinguished co-chairman, Dr. Sojamoko of Indonesia, a very leading world citizen who has uh, shared with me the responsibilities of presiding over this very eminent group of people. Uh, and I would like to introduce now on the platform with us and behind us, I believe, yes, we have first uh, Dr. Julius 
Gorinsky of Poland. Dr. Jorge Hardoy of Argentina. <laughs> Professor Akin Mabagunji of Nigeria. <laughs> and another lady who needs no introduction, none other than Dr. Margaret Mead from the United States. <laughs> I would like to say too that we have a good many, if not all, of the members of the symposium here. If you don't mind, I would like to introduce them very quickly and ask each of them to uh, stand up, uh, starting on uh, the, at the bottom, Dr. Buckminster Fuller. <laughs> and Dr. Alexander Kwapong of the United Nations University of Ghana. And Dr. Laila El Hamamsi of Egypt. <laughs> Mr. James Rouse of the USA. <laughs> and Mr. Ilted Harrington of the United Kingdom. <laughs> and Professor Dr. Uh, Konisberger uh, of the United Kingdom, <laughs> London. Big pardon? India. India. <laughs> Incidentally, I think, I think you will all recognize I'm calling everybody doctor. Many, most are professors as well. And uh, if I gave all their titles, it would take just too long. Uh, Dr. Mr. Henrik Beer, the head of the League of Red Cross Societies, who is from Sweden. And a very, uh, uh, a gentleman I think a good many of you know, uh, associated with the Green Bands movement in Australia, labor, one of the leading labor union uh, leaders in Australia, Jack Mundy. <laughs> Mr. Ho Jose Rios from Brazil. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Um, Wee uh, from Japan, Dr. Wan Wee. This consists of most of the members of the panel. Um, the others are listed in the back of the release. May I just then mention one mechanical point. Because of the speed with which the document were, was produced, there were a couple of changes to which I would like to draw your attention on page two. In the, the sixth, the fifth item on page two, which starts out in developing societies, the encouragement in migrant communities of the full range of self-help by means of security of tenure and assistance with essential services, it was intended that that item end at that point and the word with in the next sentence be deleted and this begin a separate point. Special emphasis, that separate point then reading special emphasis on the provision of clean water by a specific date. One of the important proposals that the symposium is strongly endorsing. And in the next, the second, from the next point, the one on the headed a moratorium on the adoption of nuclear technology, that should read nuclear power generation, not nuclear technology. That's in the second line, change the word uh, technology to the word power generation, a moratorium on the adoption of nuclear power generation. I, before presenting the declaration to Dr. Penalosa, who will in turn assure its deliverance to the official Habitat Conference in a way which will get the consideration and hopefully move at, uh, the uh, delegates of governments to the conference, I would like to uh, indicate, mention just two uh, main two points. I'd like to quote two, uh, two or three paragraphs from the declaration which don't, don't sum up its totality but give something of its essence. And this is also at the request of a number of the television people who indicated they wanted uh, a, a brief statement of that kind. As the nations assemble once again to consider their planetary destiny, 
we call on governments to reaffirm their commitment to the positive proposals made at the previous assemblies. We believe that here at Habitat in Vancouver, they are involved in the most urgent of all these consultations. It is in human settlements that all other issues come together to shape the daily life of the world's peoples, to determine the citizens' achievement of the goods of civilization, justice, happiness, dignity, self-respect, participation, or on the contrary, to see them lost in rejection, despair, and deepening conflict. In a very real sense, Habitat is about the whole of life. True, it therefore presents the risk of offering too vast a subject. But its promise is that it can help governments, participants, the media, the world at large, to see that in our interdependent existence, partial answers are not enough. The community itself and all of its people must become the focus of policy. Of all the issues challenging this conference, clean water perhaps deserves the highest priority. It is not only, it not only ends the dreadful toll of gastric disease, but by ensuring the survival of young children, it offers the most direct incentive to parents to bring, to stabilize their own family size. These are simply part of the essence of the statement that we are all associating ourselves with in this declaration, which we hope will contribute to influence the very, very challenging task that awaits the government delegates as they assemble for the official conference tomorrow. It is now my uh, pleasure uh, to present on behalf of the entire Vancouver Symposium and signed by all of its 23 participants, the Declaration of the Vancouver Symposium as our private citizens' contribution to the work which the official conference will commence tomorrow. My delight to present it to you, Mr. Penalosa, with our profound wish that it will assist a positive outcome to the Habitat Conference. Thank you very much. In behalf of the United Nations, I like to thank very, very much to all the participants of this symposium for this declaration. I am convinced that this is going to be to have a great impact in the final outcome of the conference. If only one of the persons subscribing this declaration would be doing it, that would be enough. But all of them together, I think is going to be a tremendous impact in the positions of all the official delegation. I like to take this opportunity also to thank many of them that have been in these last two years contributing in their personal capacity with their advice, their experience in the preparations for the conference because most of the documents going to the conference are just the results of the cooperation of UN agencies, governments, and private citizens like the very distinguished that are today with us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Penal. <laughs> Lady Jackson, who has been the source of so much of the inspiration for all of our efforts, accompanied by people of the world stature of Dr. Fuller and Dr. Mead and the others gathered here, are now going to make themselves available uh, for, to answer any questions uh, of the media. I would suggest it's a crowded room, it's difficult, but uh, there is tr translation into English and French here, and in order to assure that use of those translation facilities, it would be very helpful if uh, people could uh, use the microphones provided. 
Uh, I know that is a bit difficult, but it would be appreciated, and I think it would facilitate our, our work here. And if you wish to direct the question to any individual person, you might name that person. Otherwise, I will direct them to Lady Jackson and uh, suggest that she, in turn, if she wishes to uh, uh, redirect them or ask or call upon one of the other members, she will do so. Yeah. Would you mind identifying yourself in each case and the particular uh, organization you represent? My question is to uh, Lady Jackson. My name is Ira Leibowitz. I'm from New Solidarity International Press Service. Beginning May 18th, such prestigious bodies as the uh, Club of Rome, the uh, uh, World Bank, and others began enunciating a policy for uh, expanding the scale of labor-intensive agriculture on a global scale. The World Bank's proposal put forward, for example, by uh, Robert McNamara proposes to include upwards of a billion people in these labor-intensive agricultural projects. Uh, these are references to uh, programs that are now being run, for example, in Upper Volta, which are uh, carrying out uh, extinction of the people involved in these projects, feeding them 1,700 calories a day of food, no wages. Now, what is the question? Uh, my question is, with the emphasis in your proposal on labor-intensive development, which means these work projects, your uh, proposal for a moratorium on nuclear uh, energy generation, uh, including a moratorium, I presume, on nuclear fusion, which the East Bloc has been involved in developing, can this conference on record take you to be proposing the proposal, uh, endorsing the proposal of the Club of Rome and others for carrying out genocide against one billion human beings on this planet? I, I think the question, frankly, sounds to me like a non sequitur. Uh, I, I think I guess I think the... It is, I, it's not a non sequitur at all. The effect of these programs would be, as they are already in Honduras, Brazil, Upper Volta, genocide. Would you like to comment on that, Lady Jackson? Certainly. <laughs> I share with our chairman the feeling that it is non sequitur for the simple reason that one of the great examples of successful development in the last 25 years of the kind we are speaking of in this document and also which has now come to the attention of the World Bank is that, of course, of mainland China, where in point of fact, labor intensive intensivity in agriculture has been one of the bases upon which very rapid development, great popular sharing, and extreme advances in general standards of living has been achieved. Uh, and as far as I know, the only application of nuclear technology has been to the hydrogen bomb. I therefore feel Such that true. your question to me is misconceived, and you also miss one of the main points which is also made in this document, and that is the extraordinary degree to which much more hopeful measures of dispersed and safe energy, particularly of solar energy, will become available in the next 50 years. And the idea that the whole development of West Africa, or indeed my own crowded island of Britain, should depend upon systems which will generate totally cancer-producing wastes for the next 25,000 years seems to be a recipe not only for genocide now, but for genocide for the future of the human race. I therefore think it's a non sequitur. Thank you. Could you Thank you. I think we have to limit your questions if you don't Could you turn your attention to the Dr. Uh, Dr. experiment that was run in Brazil? Yeah, but ple uh, please and understand the plague-ridden population of Brazil. Uh, uh, one at a time. Would you please, you've had your share of time, I believe, but Dr. Fuller would like to make a comment on this. I think the name Club of Rome was very unfair to Rome. Because it was an organization of money. It was really the last attempt of rationalized selfishness on our planet to explain and comfort itself on the idea of depriving others. What is very sad about the Club of Rome is the fact that it could so quickly gain the publicity that it did. It did get the name of the Smithsonian Institute behind it. It did have the big names like Club of Rome, but 
at MIT. Computers, seemingly expertise. One of the, it turned out to be really one of the most ignorant statements that ever been made. It turned out that they, because I personally then undertook to fight them, and I found that they did not even know that m metals recirculate. They thought they were so ignorant in their, in their inputs to the, to the computers. They were assuming that metals were simply consumed like strawberries. It, what is most important to, in my answer to you now is I've fought them for two years. They were to appear in Philadelphia this year and did. Opposed to my young world group of what I call the World Gamers. At the, all of both was appearing at the University of Pennsylvania Museum. This year, the Club of Rome admitted it was wrong. They admitted that they were completely wrong and that working assumption, there was not enough to go around. Thank you very much, Dr. Schwartz. Thank you. Next question. Uh, Peter Wilshire, Sunday Times, London. Um, could Lady Jackson or Mr. Strong perhaps uh, indicate to us where they think the symposium's proposals are most in advance or most at variance or most likely to create tension with the uh, items listed in the various official conference documents? Uh, Thank you. Under the impression that the document which you are declaring this morning constitutes a sort of moral suasion on the delegations which uh, will discuss these uh, human established questions tomorrow. I would say that it is our, this is our hope because if who are to lose confidence in all moral suasions or all possibilities of moral suasion, we should all go home. Yes, I hope so. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, my name is Richardson. I'm a writer about the environment from Canada and New Zealand. And uh, before I ask my question, I'd like to uh, say that I feel uh, quite a charge from having read your uh, declaration uh, because it's, uh, although it deals with the problems of poor countries, I find that everything in it is relevant to a country like New Zealand. Uh, and for instance, on the day that this conference ends, uh, we are launching a national campaign to try and stop uh, nuclear energy for power production in New Zealand. There's two detailed things that I, I was interested in. One is a reference on page five to vast coastal cities, which are largely unlinked with the hinterlands. Uh, I suppose uh, Calcutta is such a city. And uh, I met, uh, I think you could call them these religio mystico technocrats from the United States who feel that uh, everything is working out okay. and. Uh, some of them came to New Zealand in November for a preparatory conference for this, sent a tremendous shock into a lot of Africans and Asians by claiming that there was really nothing that could be done except to accept the uh, accumulation of these 200 million people in places like Calcutta. And that indeed, uh, a place like Calcutta actually f is feeding the hinterland, that the hinterland is depending on a place like Calcutta. That seemed to be to be a, a, a fundamental difference um, in view between the people who are living in Africa and who are hoping to develop uh, the hinterland, which contains 80% of their people, and the kind of technocrats of the Western world who are thinking in terms of a huge uh, yeah. urbanization. Well, That's respect, one question. With respect, I wonder if you could... That is the question. question. Yeah. That is the question. What, uh, does anybody on your panel have a, a view as to the true nature of this relationship between the hinterland and the uh, may, vast uh, yeah. uh, developing urban... Okay, may uh, I ask uh, Charles, Dr. Charles Correa, who uh, is one of the members of our panel that I didn't, uh, d uh, I did not introduce, but uh, because he's, I didn't notice that he was in the general audience, but he would be the best person to respond to that question if you wouldn't mind doing so, Charles. Amongst other things, uh, Dr. Correa is responsible for building the new twin to Bombay. 
Well, uh, perhaps here, I... Please. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, uh, perhaps I didn't understand the question. Was it that uh, someone is advocating Calcutta going to 200 million? <laughs> well, uh, no, I, I, the largest number I'd heard was 60 million, and that wasn't advocated. That was sort of feared. It was, you know, something to be dreaded. I, I think all the policies of the government and of any rational person in India is to try and develop new growth points away from Calcutta and other parts of the of Bengal and certainly of the country. Um, there is no advantage, I would think, in in uh, prejudging the case. I mean, you would have to look at it quite objectively to decide what is the optimum balance of human settlements, and that's one of the things strongly recommended in the report. Does that answer your question? One, could I add one? Yes, yes um, Lady Jackson would I, like to add a point. On the question of the, uh, of the countryside living on Calcutta, I think one would have to point out that during the 50s and the 60s, uh, a great deal of the feeding of Calcutta was done on concessionary food aid from outside. And therefore, in any uh, likely future, the degree of dependence on food supplies will make the dependence of Calcutta upon the effective organizing of agriculture in India absolutely critical. So there's been an element, an historical element there, which suggests that uh, your friends were perhaps a little over-optimistic about the causes. Very much. Any other questions? Yes. Gentleman, I'm sorry, this gentleman was up earlier, and I'll get you next. Bruce Cameron, CBC Television News. Um, I'd like to ask you, what, uh, what reasonable hope do you have that the conference will actually adopt a, a plan to shut down nuclear power generation, given uh, the, the commitment that uh, governments have, been, have made, and also in consideration to the fact that, uh, in, in many cases, the other environmental alternatives, the other power alternatives to nuclear energy, for instance, hydro, are also very environmentally damaging, and I could go on listing each one of them. Uh, given that we have made that kind of commitment, isn't it, isn't it going, uh, is it, do you really believe that it, the governments will take the step of, of stopping it? I wonder if I might ask Dr. Mead to respond to that. I think you want to look rather carefully at the phrasing. It's the adoption of nuclear ge power generation as a major power device. There's no word here about shutting down anything. The point is that there are now proposals afoot in the world to invest in nuclear power as our principal source of power, which is particularly associated with the spread of the breeder and the breeder technology, which would be a switch as great, at least, as the difference between the atomic bomb and the nuclear bomb. And what is being called for here is a moratorium on this adoption of nuclear power as a principal source of, of energy and emphasis on the environmentally safe and economically cheaper income energies such as solar power. Thank you very much. May, may I just be permitted to add to that that, of course, we recognize the deep commitments that many governments have to nuclear energy in their search for solutions to the energy problem. The concern is clearly one about the risks posed, the, the risks still not fully evaluated uh, that are posed by nuclear power, but there's also very real doubt on the part of many of us of that a societal commitment to dependence on nuclear power as the principal source of power could have all sorts of other consequences in terms of utili uh, utilization of our capital, centralization of our uh, energy generating apparatus and the important social and political implications that would have for greater centralization of our life and dependencies on the vast central institutions. Yes. Uh, could I just add one postscript on this? One of the points which the symposium very much underlined is that much of the pressure for moving quickly to the breeder uh, option is that we're running out of energy, that if we're going to preserve civilized standards, etc., etc., this is a technological imperative. 
And the plain truth is that on sober calculations, we are now wasting 40 to 50 percent of the power which we actually buy. And that as long as we have so wasteful a society, and as long as we have this big margin, we have time to take our options slowly. We do not have to be pushed into options because, in fact, we are at the present moment chucking away our most precious resources. And I think that was very much in the mind of the symposium. I think we're all saying to governments, for God's sake, slow down. Lady, then. Uh, yes, Martha Killebrew, Quantum Communications. Uh, now, there's thousands of people who have come up very interested, vitally, of course, in everything there at the forum. And I know that in Mexico City, we were at the Tribuna, and we got together and worked out in a very democratic fashion, working on what the uh, uh, principles had been proposed. And uh, we presented them then. I was wondering of your very distinguished group, are you having any plans to work with the folks at the forum. I'm very happy you asked that. I was going to mention it before I finished. We are, of course, part of the NGO community and we'll be all in our individual capacities part of the forum. Uh, we will go down today to Jericho Beach to the forum at five o'clock and we will be presenting the declaration to the forum uh, for consideration as an input into the discussions of the forum itself. Uh, and as you know, the forum will be making its own input into the official conference. Uh, the, I should say that the members of the symposium uh, are making the, are, have agreed to make themselves available for both for participation in various forum discussions and for interviews during the next fortnight, uh, during the next two weeks uh, with members of the press. And they can be reached through the symposium press office at the Denman place. So this is, uh, we are, and I hope some of you will be there this afternoon when we make the presentation of this to our colleagues at the uh, forum. The gentleman here. Uh, I am <coughs> uh, Philip Lair of the Prairie Messenger, published suitably in the middle of Saskatchewan, Canada. I see emphasis in this document and others on uh, balanced development not only in the metropolis, also in the countryside and in, and in uh, um, settlements of intermediate size in between. And when we think of that, even in our sparsely settled Canada, especially the prairies, we run across the question, should we uh, set up disincentives to farm size? There aren't enough farmers out there for proper community, uh, for a proper community and for building the secondary and other uh, services and the processing and things like that. I'm just wondering, this could be addressed to anybody on the panel. Do you know of realistic um, efforts that have been made to limit farm size and enable a larger number of people to uh, get into agriculture? Thank you very much. Lady Jackson? Um, well, the problems do vary enormously uh, no, from oh yes, uh, from um, world to world, I think one of the difficulties has been in the past the unreadiness of a younger generation to consider a future in farming. But in point of fact, a number of people are beginning to reconsider this option. And therefore, if you have a new group of young people coming forward and wanting to go back to the family farm, the family farm is, in most parts of the world, the most productive unit in the true sense that you can get. And so much of the very large-scale farms depend upon immense inputs of energy, both in terms of mechanization and fertilizer, and it is possible that this kind of relationship may have to change, but uh, this is not my field. I, I would like to call on Mr. Lester Les Brown. Brown. Les Lester Brown, who is a member of our, is here. I'm sorry, I did not realize he was. And I didn't introduce the members over in this corner, but Les, would you like to have a word on this? I don't know about the data north of the border in Canada, but we have seen a very interesting reversal trend in the United States in the past few years. Um, uh, for several decades now, the number of farms has been declining at a fairly rapid rate. 
uh, beginning in about 1973, that reversed, and it reflects a number of things. It reflects the inherent difficulties in continuing to substitute large amounts of energy for labor and agriculture. It reflects a strong desire by a growing number of people to, to create a more habitable uh, environment and uh, in which to, to live and to raise families. So we're seeing a lot of uh, people returning to farms in a way uh, that would have been uh, impossible to anticipate a few years ago. One of the important things that we have to keep in mind when we think about human settlements and the movement of people from countryside to cities, uh, which has been so dramatic during the past quarter century, is that this does depend on an ever-growing surplus of food produced in the countryside. And what we have seen during the third quarter of this century is the cities of the world becoming enormously dependent on food exports from one region, your prairies in the Canada and uh, of, of North America generally. Um, and if that uh, growing surplus, uh, which I might mention this year is estimated at 94 million tons of grain from the United States and Canada, which will in consumption terms support 560 million Indians or 115 million Russians in industrial country terms, um, is, is really being used to, to feed most of the people who moved into the cities over the past 25 years. So one of the things that I think will probably affect very much and constrain uh, the rate of movement from countryside to city uh, during the next 25 years will be the capacity of the countryside to produce food surpluses. Thank you very much. I've just realized, and I look over here, that two other of our colleagues on the symposium were here all the time, and I didn't introduce them because I didn't realize they were here. This is uh, 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 Dr. Eduardo Terrazas from Mexico and uh, Dr. Uh, Aprodicio Laquian from the Philippines and Canada. Now, uh, the lady over here has been waiting, I think, for... Elizabeth Carroll from America. I have not had the opportunity to read the document, but I'm wondering if in it there is any encouragement to the less populated nations to open their immigration policies further. Lady Jackson? Um, <coughs> in a veiled form, yes. Because the document says that those who control fertile land and protein sanctuaries cannot expect that the laws of history will be so revised that they can keep it inviolate in a very hungry world. In other words, that there are choices facing these countries, which is either to get going on a world plan for the development of peoples in their own countries, or they will find that the immigration which they tend to resist may happen whether they like it or not. Uh, it is a, a somewhat historical statement, but it is in the document. I wonder if our co-chairman, Mr. Sojimoko, would like to say anything on this subject. Yes, the uh, wording in the uh, document uh, has been, uh, well, for the wording, has been chosen a rather historical statement rather than a, uh, the statement of a, a policy recommendation in the light of the sensitivity of the problem. But in as much as this document is not only addressed to government and delegate, and to governments and to delegations, but to uh, the world community at large, uh, we felt very strongly that we should not uh, delete the reference to this very important problem. We see that an increasingly a large part of uh, uh, the people in various countries uh, move in search of work to cities, but also cross international boundaries. And they tend to live and to be accepted uh, in uh, conditions that are not in line and not commensurate with the opportunities that are offered to uh, other people in those countries. And so we tend to see the development or the growth of an increasingly large number of people who are not protected by the laws uh, and regulations uh, that govern the life of the citizens of those countries. And uh, unless we are prepared in the world to uh, uh, to change the distribution of productive capability 
across the globe in a more equitable sense, the world will have to face uh, the problem of increased pressure of population movement across international boundaries. Thank you very much. And as a person from a country that has a disproportionate share of the world's territory and resources, may I say it even less uh, politely and diplomatically than my co-chairman friend has said it, that if those with territory and resources beyond their, no, the, beyond, uh, their proper share or their pro rata share are not prepared to do a better job of sharing the resources, they may find increasing pressures even on their territory. Um, may I, I think the man b b behind was first and then, then uh, the gentleman there and then the gentleman there. Uh, Andrisa Mutil Svoboda in the United States. Uh, my question is directed to Lady Jackson. Uh, I had the good fortune of reading your uh, pamphlet uh, prepared in preparation for Habitat and uh, one of the things that you mentioned in the pamphlet was the uh, question of movement of people. Uh, I want to follow up on those questions. Uh, the freedom of movement. And you said that some countries don't even recognize this in principle. And my question is, I noted through uh, reading through the declaration that although mass migration is mentioned here and there, this principle as such is not mentioned or supported. And I, I know the Secretary General was asked yesterday about it, and he said, well, it's up to the governments to discuss, to decide what they're going to discuss. So I wanted to ask, uh, has this uh, uh, group uh, sort of more or less uh, backed down on the principle of freedom of movement, or what is the uh, sort of view of the group with regard to that principle? Uh, I think in a way uh, I would say the group recognized Mr. Strong's answer, which is that the freedom of, princi the freedom of movement principle is one which even within countries it's a difficult one when you see, for instance, the movement out of ghettos, the attempt for people to move out of cities. And we didn't feel in our two days that we could get into all the difficulties. What we did feel we could say was that unless the resources were shared, then freedom of movement would take place in the most violent fashion. In other words, we put it in a, in a historical context, not, I think, because we were ducking the issue, but because in a short document, all the internal problems of movement would have had to come in too. And uh, it, it had to be a short document. So I think we, we put it in historically yeah. as a warning. The drive for Liebesrum uh, is not yet uh, dead. We may have even yet uh, mm. not begun to see it, uh, it in operation. Uh, yes, the gentleman there. Uh, I think my question may be addressed to Lady Jackson. My name is David Hall of the British planning magazine, Town and Country Planning, published by the Town and Country Planning Association. I'm afraid I've not yet had the chance to read the document, but I would be very interested to know what it says on the question of land values and the extent to which land values, which are generated by a community's own efforts, can be recouped by that community to help it to rebuild and to make its own towns and cities and villages uh, without the profits going to people who may have contributed nothing to the effort. Uh, it's probably the most unequivocal part of the whole statement that unearned increment goes back to the community without any doubt whatsoever and it was the unanimous uh, opinion of the group that this should be so. Thank you. Yes. Um, my name is Clyde Sanger and I represent the Manchester Guardian. My question is to Lady Jackson. Um, in, and it's about clean water. Um, in your uh, tour across Canada, which has obviously been extremely welcome, uh, you've made this the, a major point. Again, this morning it's said to be a primary concern, although I don't think you're going into details uh, about it in the declaration. Would you like to comment on the view that um, the technology and the engineering growth in Latin America, the percentage of the population which is not served by uh, clear water, clean water, is growing tremendously. I think that one of the, the discussions we had in the symposium was that uh, the construction of water systems for the population is closely related to the other issue that was presented uh, by the, the question that was asked by the gentleman before related to the problem of the land. 
is extremely difficult for the future construction of whatever s the public services will be constructed and incorporated into human settlements to do that unless you have a very uh, close control of physical growth and control of physical growth is closely related to this issue of land. We all believe also in the symposium that uh, probably clean water is undoubtedly one of the investment, concentrated investments that can bring the more rapid benefit in terms of health, etc., to the majority of the population, which at the moment are not, um, do not have uh, that service available. Thank you. Thank you very much. Might I just add one point, that the water issue really illustrates dramatically the larger issue of human settlements. We cannot hide behind an availability of technology. The technology is available, the need for it, the demand for it, the people to do it. Uh, all the answers are really available, the basic answers to produce not only water for every person in the world, but decent human settlements for every person in the world. What really you need are needed is the kind of government strategies, government commitments to provide the context and the framework in which the people and the technology can get together and produce uh, uh, the, uh, produce quality human settlements. And this, this, I think, is one of the central thrusts in our whole deliberations. Governments simply cannot hide behind the inadequacies of existing uh, technologies uh, or available labor or resources. Yes, the lady in front here. Uh, my name is Valeska von Rock of the German magazine. Yeah, please. My name is Valeska von Rock of the German magazine Der Spiegel. I'm the New York correspondent of this magazine, and I would like to pose my question to Margaret Mead. Um, should I read out of the uh, recommendation to lessen the pressure on big cities by uh, reinforcing rural settlements that uh, problems of a city like New York could be eased by uh, recommending the migration of the West uh, 79th Street Block Association to Vermont? Um, and then, uh, and this seems to, to really point uh, to a, a larger problem of, of this, this, this uh, declaration and this whole conference. Uh, how are, uh, do the problems of cities like New York, Detroit, to a very small degree, even Berlin and Germany, relate to the rec uh, recommendations like such in your document? Dr. Mead? No, I am not recommending that the migration of people from New York. There are people who are trying to make solve New York's problems by just hoping that the million people who are poor will just somehow go away uh, if they continue to wreck the social services in New York City, which of course is impossible. When we're talking about lessening the pressures on the cities, what we're talking about is a more even distribution of population over the country and in uh, situations like the United States, this would mean, among other things, a federal system of welfare, which would mean that we don't drive the poor from the countryside into the cities where they hope to get at least a little food or possibly a little bit of income, if not continuous uh, employment. This is what we're talking about. We're talking about national plans which will look at the problems of pockets of poverty within the country, of the relationship between rural areas that are underserviced and undercared for, and cities on which there is made a disproportionate demand to care for the poor from the countryside because during the last 25 years, most of the push has gone, in developing countries particularly, into the cities, a disproportionate amount has gone into the cities, and very little into the countryside. So you drive the starving poor from the countryside into the cities that lack the employment that's ready to receive them. But I congratulate you on uh, picking up a point that troubles us very much in New York, where we're faced with both federal and local people who think if they treat the poor badly enough, they'll somehow go away. Thank you. Thank you.
Lester Brown wanted to have a word on this one, too, Les. Quite apart from what the 79th Street uh, Block Association does, there is uh, uh, a very substantial redistribution of population occurring in the United States, uh, which is both, um, uh, in, in some ways, an interesting case of de-urbanization. Um, we are seeing some of the larger cities lose population. We are seeing a national redistribution occur where um, the, the, the population center of gravity is moving steadily southward in the country and away from the traditional northeastern concentration. We're seeing um, uh, in a number of countries around the world, outside the United States, um, uh, situations where the investment per capita in the urban areas is uh, five, eight, ten times as great as investment per capita of public resources in rural areas. And this is one of the reasons why uh, governments uh, in so much of the world are faced with a uh, continuing, very rapid uh, and large flow of people uh, into the cities. One of the things we touched on very lightly in our discussions was that while the focus is on urbanization, there is and probably will be uh, a fair amount of de-urbanization in certain situations in certain parts of the world in the years ahead. Thank you very much. The gentleman at the middle mic. Thank you. Roy May from the United States in Bolivia. I represent the United Methodist Reporter. I'd like to address my question to, to Lady Jackson, but perhaps uh, Dr. Ardoy could comment afterwards specifically in terms of the Latin American context. My question is related to your participation in forum. Uh, although your declaration is, is directed toward governments of the world, how would you view the participation of non-governmental organizations, and particularly the churches, since I represent a church publication, in creating the kind of society that your symposium is, is uh, proposing? Well, if I may just address myself to the, to the church issue, I would say there are, there are two ways, as ever, in which it can be done. One is much more difficult than the other, so we'll take the easy one first. The easy one is to form active citizen groups in every country to bully and bite and generally harass politicians so that they actually feel that there's a vote at stake in those countries which are open. And as the, those countries which have got most of the money are still open, there is a good deal of room for very heavy lobbying on behalf of the deprived and the, the miserable people of the world. And it comes particularly rightly from Christians because they can be radical in the light of their Lord. The second, which is much more difficult, is to live in a slightly less affluent fashion oneself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think I, I, think I might add to that that I believe it, I would speak for the whole group in saying that if it were not for the efforts of private citizens and the, various, the churches and other non-governmental organizations through which they work, there probably wouldn't have been a Stockholm conference, there wouldn't have been a Habitat conference. The results of those conferences would not have been as positive as they were, and the monitoring of follow-up, the pressure on governments to perform, would certainly not have been there. In other words, I believe in virtually all these cases, the people have been ahead uh, of their government representatives, and the government representatives welcome, in most cases, the kind of pressures that citizens groups like this can generate. Could I just add one more point? One of the reasons for putting emphasis on water is that it seems to me that it's difficult for a busy citizens to get to the bottom of things like the new economic order and so forth. It's essential that it should change, but it's a more complicated issue. But you can go to almost anyone and say, do you want children, 60% of them, to die of gastritis under the age of five? Do you really want one third of the world to have dysentery? Are you really content to have 1% that is all that is necessary of your arms budget spent upon giving clean water to the human race? And those are questions which citizens can grasp. And I would hope and pray that the church groups in particular for whom water has, after all, some sacral character, 
would be absolutely in the forefront of the movement. May I just ask Dr. Hardoy to comment on this one? Um, as you all know, the cities of Latin America and also the cities of Africa and Asia are cities of formed basically by young people and poor people. Uh, some churches have worked with young people and poor people. And some churches, they have a good record in Latin America with, uh, of getting involved with some of the, uh, what I would call the constructive groups for the development of our countries. It is not always so. I wish that churches working in Latin American cities will not only work at uh, what I would call a neighborhood scale, but also will try to project their efforts and their image and the moral conscientiousness to a much larger uh, scale. I think that this is extremely important. As you know, as well as I do, there is going to be a series of meetings of people related to the church movement in relation with the NGO uh, forum. And I think that some of the members of our symposium are participating in that uh, event. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have only time for two more questions. I'll give the gentleman the, here the floor. Leon Howell from the United States Christian Century Magazine. UNCTAD 4 is just concluding its work, with, uh, talking about the new international economic policy and new trade and development concerns. Uh, I f I'm wondering if the document here continues to assume that aid from the rich countries can be cajoled or given generously sufficient to close the kind of gap you're talking about in the end of this document, or whether you see some relationship between this and the kinds of things that are being talked about in the new international economic policy. I think we'll get somebody from the developing world, uh, Professor Abagunji from uh, Nigeria, to comment on this. Well, I think this is a very important question, particularly at a time when uh, the attitude of <coughs> developing countries to the profession of interest in development by developed country is starting to be one of cynicism. But it is not a cynicism which should breed despair. And I think myself, the whole point of conferences like we've had in uh, Stockholm that we have in here is precisely because it keeps bringing the world community back to the fact of their interdependency. Uh, the growing awareness that you just couldn't get away with it in the long run to have a world divided between the very rich and the very poor and for people to keep reminding each other about the inherent dangers, I think this would be one of the ways in which this conference on habitat uh, would in fact be helping. I, I like to emphasize that what one is looking for is a leverage to keep pushing, pushing the world government to move in the direction which in the longer run would be in the interest of the whole human community. Uh, I, I, I must say the report from uh, UNCTAD has not been too encouraging, but then this is the whole point we're saying here, that one doesn't lose hope. Maybe if we start moving through the area of habitat, some changes might happen, and eventually UNCTAD will go on meeting, and maybe there would be some change, as I said, not in the too longer run, but it has to happen too soon before despair turns to real violence. Thank you. Very, thank you very, very much. I'd like Lady Jackson to make a comment on this as well. Just on the specific UNCTAD point, uh, I would say that if you look back over 10 years to the various UNCTAD conferences, mm. one of the tremendous changes has been the balance of power to the OPEC, which is a reminder to the world that even power relationships are not permanent. And, um, as Dr. Johnson once remarked, the prospect of being hanged in a fortnight gives you wonderfully to reflect. And I can't help thinking that there is a new attitude, a new readiness to see that relationships not only must change, but can change and will change. Right. And so that within that context, as Dr. Mabukunji was saying, this continuous world dialogue is moving us towards 
a greater sense of, if you like, the realization that we have within a society that you cannot carry on with 90% of your people unrepresented, without work, without employment, it breaks down. And the UNCTAD uh, seance, which I believe has had a bit of a breakthrough over the weekend, uh, is obviously in part the successful pressure that has been added by the OPEC countries, and in part the continuance, we hope, of some conscience among the developed. Thank you very much. I see a lady, ladies haven't had equal time, and this lady has been asking for the floor on this subject. And may. We, are you? Yes. I see two other ladies and one gentleman, and I will have to cut it off then. Yeah. My name is Mangalam Srinivasan. I am a consultant working in the area of international development. Um, I was going to ask our Nigerian friend here about uh, a new international economic order. In my continued work in the area in the last two years, the people of any country in Asia or Africa, they have never heard of this. Now, it really has boiled down to a dialogue between the, uh, um, those uh, that are interested in bringing about change for themselves versus the rich countries. Also, what happens is when you have uh, the rich negotiate with the rich, and uh, for instance, country like India, they are on either side. They come as, a, as, a, as someone asking for something while in their own country, they are precisely the kind of a precise uh, obstacle to social change. But I, what, what I wanted to ask was, how is this relevant? Because I've met uh, 100 women who came from East Berlin World Congress of Women. Now, no one...